The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to this morning's Helpline session with your host, James McDonald. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. And I'd like to start by welcoming our participants to our Monday morning open forum Q&A, our helpline session here, and a happy Canadian Thanksgiving um, to all the Canucks on the, uh, on the webinar here this morning. I know it sounds odd that uh, it is Canadian Thanksgiving today, so it's a big holiday in Canada. Uh, so maybe some of our Canadian friends are um, uh, on the webinar here and have some questions. But remember this, every Monday morning, the idea is we can talk about anything you like. There is no topic. You determine what the topic is, so we can start with any kind of discussion, and it can go in any direction we want. And we'll take an hour, and we'll take as many questions or discussion topics as time permits, and we'll get everybody's brain in Craig Proctor mode. And uh, that's a great way to start off the week. Now, I did get a few emails uh, that were that were sent, and I thought would be gr wonderful to address to everybody. Um, on the webinar here this morning. The first one was in regards to uh, signage. Not, uh, not, not a for sale sign, but more sign riders. And uh, a little bit of detail in regards to where to get the sign riders, what the sign riders should say. So I, I wanna touch on that to start and then we'll move on to the next email that I got that's a little more in depth. But here's the bottom line. When it comes to signage, um, what we suggest is that using a local sign company makes a lot more dollars and cents. As long as the, the local sign company is able to, um, you know, create the signs to say what you want them to say, to look the way you want them to look, then doing it locally makes a lot more sense. You can drive and pick them up or they can carry them over to you. But if you're ordering the signs from, you know, from someplace else, like Craig's sign company is in Canada. Well, that makes no sense to do that. So here's what you want to consider more is what, uh, what do the sign writers say and you really do have some options here as far as the sign writers go okay the first and most um, universal sign writer universal meaning it can it can be applicable to any property listing you have anywhere at any price range and that would be a sign writer that offers 24 hour recorded information on this property for sale all right so that that sign writer would be obviously promoting your hotline number and it would allow prospects to call into your hotline number to hear recorded information about the property for sale. All right, so that's a that's a pretty obvious one and it's great to have because again, it's very versatile and universally it would go with any property listing that you have. Okay, now number two. Uh, another another um, sign writer that's ultra effective, um, partic particularly on the right listings, says open daily call for times or open house daily call for times. And if you really think about it, um, the, the property can be open at any point in time. Is If a buyer calls you and wants to set, schedule a showing for that property, at any time throughout the day, they, they could call you and you could set that up. So is it open daily? Yes, absolutely. Is the house open daily? Yes, it is. But I want you to think of the perception from the buyer prospect on the sign writer. It says open house daily call for times. They call and say, when is the property available? When is the open house on this property? And the answer is, well, when would you like to see it? And, the, and and then, of course, you can go through the, uh, the qualifying questions in the script, but you would show it at any point in time. Remember, if the purpose of, gener of, of running an ad is to generate a response, then open house daily call for times is a great way of getting the phone to ring from a motivated prospect that wants to look at a property for sale. Uh, okay, so that's another one. And then, of course, the third sign writer option that you have is a unique selling proposition. Now, really, the 24-hour hotline is a unique selling proposition. We would classify that as a service USP. The fact that you can call and get 24-hour recorded info on a property for sale, that, that is a service USP. But let's talk more about a performance guarantee on your for sale sign. Uh, and of course, the, the performance guarantee that is best, uh, the best performer that Craig used very successfully as to many of our platinum students uh, for many, many years is move up to this home and I'll buy yours. Um, move up to this home and I'll buy yours is really effective in two ways. One, 
it's a great USP for a prospective buyer with a home to sell. So if it's in a move up price range, in other words, if the overwhelming majority of the buyers that would be interested in that property have homes to sell, they're not first time buyers, that's a really powerful message. Move up to this home and I'll buy yours. Um, but it's also very attractive to the other prospective sellers in the neighborhood who are considering putting their home on the market are noticing all the for sale signs, which are all identical except for yours, because yours says, move up to this home and I'll buy yours. And they look at that and they see that as a tremendous advantage and they say, I want that one. And so indirectly, that that sign writer becomes a listing tool, uh, a, a lead generation tool for other prospective sellers in the neighborhood. So as far as sign, sign riders go, those are the three things that you want to consider. Number one, we want to have uh, a 24-hour recorded hotline. All right, that would be one option. Uh, you know, 24-hour recorded information on this property for sale. Your 1-800 number with the ID code. Next, open house daily call for times, and then number three. Uh, a unique selling proposition, a performance guarantee that acts not only as a lead generator for buyers, but also as an attraction for other prospective sellers in the neighborhood that see the for sale sign, like move up to this home and I'll buy yours. Uh, okay, so anyway, that's it for, uh, for that question. Hopefully that was answered uh, sufficiently. Now I had another question here uh, from one of our coaching students who is generating leads and they've done a lot of different things to generate leads um, and I'm not going to use any specific names but this is good because it's applicable to a lot of you particularly those of you who are newer starting over the last few months here a couple things uh, that are reality is that when you're generating leads from one source and you are generating leads from that source the idea is not to then discontinue that source and try something else the idea is to add to it you want to think of it this way we want to have multiple streams of lead generation we want our leads to be coming in from multiple sources we um, if we're running editorial style ads we want to we want to uh, generate those typically sellers who uh, might more often be a little more down the road than say someone who's searching for properties for sale on Google or in a print publication responding to an ad offering homes for sale or a specific property so remember that and we want to be diverse you want to make sure that your lead generation is coming from multiple sources if something isn't working then we can change it or discontinue but if something is generating leads we're never going to stop doing that we can refine those leads but we're never going to stop doing it we're always going to add to it but here's the bigger issue instead of trying each one and and they successfully generating leads and then determining well I'm not converting those leads, so I'm going to stop doing that and I'm going to do these leads. And then when you generate leads from that source, you also don't convert those leads, so you quit that and then move on to another source, generate leads from that source, determine you can't convert those leads into sales, quit that and move on to something else. At some point, here's what we have to come to the realization that the leads are very, very similar. Okay, the leads are very similar. All the prospects have asked you for real estate information and all of the leads have given up their anonymity in order to ask for the real estate information. It doesn't matter what source. If, an, if I request an editorial ad, I left a message asking for real estate information and I gave my contact details. If I requested an online home evaluation, I left all the details and asked for the information and I gave up my anonymity. If I requested a list of properties, I asked for the list of properties, I gave my contact details. The prospects all have this in common. Every single prospect asked for real estate information and gave up their anonymity in order to get that information. So if you're not converting one, you're not going to be able to convert any of them. All we're doing is we're looking for a lead source where the fish jump into the boat and we're never going to find it. What we need to do is shift gears here. So here's my advice to this, to this member. Here's the good news. You are generating leads from just about everything you try. 
whether it's editorial style ads, whether it's Zbuyer, whether it's direct mail, online home evaluations, everything you're doing is successfully identifying prospects. Everything is successfully getting prospective buyers and sellers to raise their hand, ask for the information that you're offering, and give up their anonymity. They're doing it because they're serious and they're good prospects. Here's what's happening though. Regardless of the source, when you follow up with that prospect, you're not getting anywhere with them. And it doesn't matter what source they're coming from, but you're not getting anywhere with them regardless of where they're coming from, regardless of the fact that they asked for real estate information and gave up their anonymity, thus projecting some seriousness and, and some motivation. So here's what we have to understand. If that's the case, it's us. It's not the leads. And you can forever try to hunt for better and better leads. But here's the deal. If we don't do and say the right things to the prospect, the prospects are all going to appear as though they're less motivated than they actually are. So you must put 100% of your focus into two things. Number one, and most critically, is your, your lead follow-up using the universal callback script. If I were to role play with you the universal callback script, what I would find is that it's, it's, it's very lacking. And if it's very lacking, then two things are a problem here. Number one, we don't successfully determine the timing or motivation of the prospect. We let the prospect tell us that they're not interested, which is what they'll all tell you if you let them. Right? May I help you? No, thanks. Just looking. Oh, you're just okay. Well, have a great day then. Bye. Another bad lead. But they're not a bad lead. We just didn't do the correct things. We didn't say the correct things to determine the timing and motivation of the prospect. So this is critical. Using the universal script, we must be good at asking the right questions, listening to the answers, and not letting the prospect just say to us, no, no, I'm, I'm not. I was just curious. Of course they're just curious. Everybody's just curious. I was at the mall, the outlet mall yesterday, and when a salesperson said, may I help you, I said, just looking even though I bought stuff. So yes, that's what we do. We go to the car dealership and say, just looking, then we buy a car. It's normal. Of course, they're all just curious. They're curious because they're looking to buy or sell. That's why they're curious. So we've got to be really good in asking these probing questions in the universal script. Number two, we have to become really effective at making the offer so that the prospect is, is able to focus on the benefit of the offer and want it. And if the prospect really understands the benefit of the offer you're making, and they want it, then booking the appointment to get it is, is easy. But if they really don't understand the benefit of what you're offering, they're not going to book appointments with you. And that's the, that's the challenge. So I guess what I'm saying is this. If you're generating prospects, well, if you're not generating prospects, then obviously that's the problem. But if you are are generating prospects and better than that you're generating prospects from multiple different sources print advertisement direct mail online stuff that's such good news that means what you're doing is generating a couple of prospects every day two three leads a day is over 1,000 a year so we've got ample leads to work with. Now what we have to turn our focus to is doing a really good job of using the universal callback script to determine the timing and motivation of these prospects, all of whom, all of whom are going to tell you that they're just curious and they're just looking. But they're not. The overwhelming majority, overwhelming majority, are not just curious and they're not just looking. The reason they gave up their anonymity is because they were more than just curious. Curious you might do without giving up your anonymity, but when you give up your anonymity and tell, you know, give your contact details, the reason you're likely doing that overwhelmingly is because you're serious, you're a serious prospect. So we've got to have that correct mindset and we've got to do a much better job of asking the right questions in the universal script, listening to the answer, and then getting really good at booking these appointments. And then the second thing we have to become really good at is the appointment itself. So our member did generate, uh, uh, did convert a couple of listing appointments, and in both cases, the appointments were way premature. So yes, they are selling, but they're not selling for some time now. 
So two things with that. Number one, that's the fault of the universal script. The universal script isn't designed to book an appointment with everyone you can. It's designed to book an appointment with everyone you should, right? So if the prospect isn't selling for six months, then you shouldn't book a listing appointment with them. But we also have to be uh, versatile in that we know we can pivot. Are you staying in the area? Have you started looking for a property? Because if the answer to that question is yes, then you can convert them as a buyer. If they are your client by signing a buyer contract, you're going to get their listing when the time is right. So to leave empty handed is many times unnecessary. Um, so all of these things are what you need to consider, but the, the bottom line answer is this. Once we determine that we can generate leads, our, our focus must go completely to lead conversion and lead conversion in two ways. One, universal script, two, face-to-face, -face, being really effective with the buyer and the listing presentation. Okay, that was, a, um, that was kind of a long, long answer, but um, I think that might be applicable to a lot, of, uh, a lot of you on the webinar here today. Andrea. Uh, we have other questions I know that have been emailed in or, or entered into the chat. So why don't we start taking some of those and we'll just take as many as uh, time permits. Our first is from Michelle and she's saying she's new and is having difficulty coming up with a USP that she feels comfortable with. They don't want to offer promises they can't keep and are reluctant to offer the guarantees. What advice can you offer them to create a dynamic USP they can stand by? Just a side note, she let me know currently everything she's trying, she has gotten no leads. Okay, well, if you're not if you're not generating leads, then the focus should be on lead generation. All right, now that doesn't mean you don't need a USP. You do, but first things first, we need to have leads coming into your funnel. So you need to work with your coach on lead generation. The um, the question that I just answered previously, that student, um, they're new as well. Like, but everything that they're they've tried, whether it's editorial ads, whether it's online stuff, whether it's direct mail, everything has generated leads for them. Uh, so that's first things first is to to ha to focus on a unique selling proposition when you're not even generating leads is putting the carriage before the horse. Think of it this way. In the very beginning, the reason you want to have a USP is not as a lead generator. It's to help you convert the leads that you're generating. In other words, when you generate a lead and that lead says, why should I choose to do business with you when I could do business with anybody else? We need to have an answer to that question. And the answer is our unique selling proposition. So I'm going to break up the answer into two parts. One, you've got to work on lead generation. The best me means of lead generation are less branded. All right. Google pay-per-click, Facebook, uh, you know, as far as online stuff goes, direct mail, uh, using every door direct, super cheap. Um, uh, editorial style ads in the local paper, classified ads in the local paper that offer lists of properties for sale, remnant space ads, right? These are the kinds of these are the kinds of lead generators that are tested and tried. And if you tweak them enough, you will arrive at the formula where you can generate a lead or two every single day from each one. And now we're not talking about lead generation anymore. Now we're talking about lead conversion. So the second phase then is getting really good at determining timing and motivation using the universal script and booking appointments with the prospects that you should. Then the third phase is your presentation. That's where having a unique selling proposition is really important. And I would suggest this. You divide up the unique selling proposition into three three parts. All right. There are three platforms of USP. Number one are performance guarantees, a guaranteed performance. Number two are services. And number three are statistics. All of them are USPs. If what we're talking about is a performance guarantee, we can start off with a very easy, basic performance guarantee, like a cancellation guarantee. Your cancellation guarantee is a performance guarantee. Why should I choose to list my home with you when I could list with anybody else? Well, one of the very first things that I'd like to offer you that I offered all of my clients for their peace of mind is called my cancellation guarantee. And in writing, I'm stating that if at any point in time you don't feel that I'm doing the job you anticipated that I would do, in fact, if I, I'm not exceeding your expectations with this service that I provide and with the job that I do, I don't want you to lose sleep thinking that you've made a mistake in hiring a bad realtor. I offer this to you because I know that I will exceed your expectations and this will give you peace of mind to ensure that I do. And by the way, out of curiosity, did any of the other agents that you interviewed offer a cancellation guarantee as well? And the answer is no. 
right? So that would be an example of a performance guarantee that is really simple that any realtor on day one could offer their clients. All the way up to something that's a little more bold like you know, a guarantee that says, um, I will sell your home within 60 days guaranteed, and if I don't, I'll pay you $1,000 at closing or $2,000 at closing or $3,000 at closing, or I'll sell it for free. I won't take a commission, period. That doesn't mean that you won't pay a commission to you know, the broker or the cooperating broker, but, but I won't take a commission if I don't sell your home in 60 days. That's a performance guarantee. What are, the, what are the rules to it? Simple. You and I must mutually agree on market value of the property, and we can't underprice or overprice the property. That's the rule. Very simple. One rule. We must mutually agree on market value, mutually, you and I together, and we may not undervalue the property, nor may we overvalue the property. That's the rule, and that's it. As long as we, we come to a mutual agreement on that, I will give you this guarantee. And anybody can do that. It's basic. What a lot of our students mistakenly think is that a guarantee means the guaranteed sale program. Well, that's, that's an example of a performance guarantee, but it certainly by any stretch isn't the only one. If you're in a super hot market where homes are selling with multiple offers, you could make a guarantee that says, I'll sell your home for 100% of asking price guaranteed, or I'll pay you the difference. Now, you might think, oh my God, that's crazy. No, simple rule. We must mutually agree on market value, and we may not underprice the property or overprice the property on market value. That's it. How about this for a condition? The difference can't exceed your portion of the commission. So the worst case scenario is you would sell it for free, your portion of the commission. Whatever you would keep, you would give back. It can't exceed that. So if they get a low ball offer, and then that's, that's what you get. You made a big mistake on establishing market value. The worst case scenario is you'd work for free. Now, that would be the same scenario as not getting the listing in the first place or having it expire. But the reason you're doing this is because you know the market in your, your so well that that's not a possibility. So consider these things when you're talking about the USP. But I have to tell you, one of the confusions that our, that our newer students have is this. There's a difference between having unique selling propositions and advertising unique selling propositions, right? The way we start is you're going to use your unique selling propositions verbally. It's free. You're going to use your USPs in your presentations when you're face-to-face, -face, when you're talking, communicating with your prospect. You're, you use your USPs. It's free to use them that way. So the idea that having a USP means we need to have a billboard with the USP on it is not true at all. We, we are going to get to the point where we can promote our USP, but only when that time is appropriate. And when would that time be appropriate? When we're already generating leads from less branded sources. So we already have a funnel, all right? We have a funnel. And the funnel brings in leads every single day we have the skills to determine timing and motivation and convert those leads to, to appointments. When we have the appointments, we have a presentation that defines all of our USPs, sets us apart, and procures listings and buyer contracts. It is at that time, now we're making money with our funnel, now we can start to promote branded advertising that promotes our unique selling proposition. And preferably, if we're talking about promoting our unique, unique selling proposition, preferably we would be promoting a performance guarantee, right? So uh, some kind of guaranteed sale program, right? That doesn't mean it necessarily has to be I'll buy your home, but some sort of a guaranteed program that other realtors aren't offering that would really set you apart in your community. That's a great question, Andrea. Uh, what do we got next? Our next question is from Ellen. Hold on one moment. It says, what do you suggest we say if a prospective seller or buyer client asks us how many prospects we have sold in their particular neighborhood if the answer is zero? Okay, so um, you very likely work for a company. Um, it's not a guarantee, but let's, uh, let's play a hunch here that you work for a company. And that company has sold homes in that neighborhood, perhaps then you would be able to use the word we have sold and insert number here, right? You work for a company. So what you would do is you would use your company in that circumstance. Now, let's say that that's taken off the table. 
what you're going to have to explain is this: is that you know, statistically, the local community doesn't change the marketing from neighborhood to neighborhood. But so, although you may not have sold homes in one particular neighborhood, the marketing strategy for your marketplace as a whole is the same, and buyers who are purchasing properties in this neighborhood are also buyers that are purchasing properties in other neighborhoods. Your job is to show that you can attract buyers to their property. So regardless of whether that's buyers to their neighborhood or neighborhoods in the marketplace, that's what you need to be able to show them. So what if you could do this? What if you could say, not just say, but show them that you have a buyers in waiting program and you have a hundred buyers that have asked you for properties in the local area and of those hundred buyers dozens of them are looking for properties right in your marketplace now i'd like to share with you my buyers in waiting now where does this buyers in waiting come from if you're running ads that offer properties for sale every time you generate a buyer and the buyer describes what they're looking for and where and gives their contact details and hit submit on your website, you're going to print that, that email, that request, you're going to print it on an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper. Why? Because that's your buyers and waiting list. If every day you generated two buyers and in, in a month we'd have 60, in two months we'd have 120 buyers that, that told us what they're looking for, told us where they're looking for it, and gave their contact details. We could show our seller that list, and that way, even if you personally didn't sell anything in that neighborhood, you were able to say this, I generate buyers in this neighborhood. I want to share with you my buyers in waiting program. These are buyers that have asked for real estate information in areas around our marketplace, including right in this neighborhood. As a matter of fact, if we thumb through my buyers in waiting here, we'll very likely find several buyers right now who are looking for properties for sale, just like yours, in this neighborhood. By the way, did the other agents you interviewed share with you their list of buyers that are currently looking for properties in this neighborhood? And the answer, of course, is no. So we got to remember that is that the way that we can really compel the seller is with buyers. Sellers want buyers. Buyers want homes. Sellers want buyers. So instead of focusing on the sales that you may or may not have had, what you'll find is far more effective to the seller is for you to focus on the buyers you have. Not just telling them, but showing them. Here's how I generate buyers in your neighborhood, in your, mar in your, in your uh, community. And here's the result of what I do. Let me share with you my buyers in waiting um, that I'm currently working with right here. Very, very powerful and unique to you because the other realtors are, it's very unlikely that they are physically showing the buyers that they're working with to the seller, which you know would be critical. Okay, great question, Andrea. Okay, we have a question um, that you can answer. Uh the two questions from different members and what it is is I'd like to target absentee owners what postcard ads would you recommend and the next question goes with it how long would you see a turnaround from sending out mailers um, okay so uh, the first question what would you what would you send um, uh, well one thing is you want to target uh, you want to speak to the prospect so what do we know about the prospect number one we know that, that it's an investment property uh, do we know that though I mean um, it, they're they're absentee owners, um, but are the homes vacant or are they generally speaking uh, rented? Because here's the bottom line: is that if this is an investment property, then we can actually say that in the message. If we can direct mail uh, an absentee owner, then the direct mail can call out to your investment opportunity is worth more money than you think. Right, we can we can actually call it them. Not only that, but also geographically. So, your uh, you know your Tampa investment property is worth more than you think. Find out online. Um, your Florida investment property um, has reached its peak in um, of value. You know, I, but the bottom line is this: if we're going to be compelling to 
any prospect. We have to call out specifically to that prospect. We cannot offer them generic information. We must offer them specific information to them. So if these are investment properties, we need to address that. If these are in a very a particular geographical location, then we need to reference that as well. Uh, the best way to do this is to direct mail, plain white uh, number 10 envelope, handwritten live stamp. Why? Because it will get opened. And remember, this is a supplement to your lead generation. This is not a, uh, you know, this is not a strategy to generate the bulk of your business. This would be a supplement to your lead generation um, if there are plenty of them. Now, the next question was about frequency. How often do you send this? And this is true with any direct mail campaign. Doesn't matter whether it would be absentee owners or otherwise. There is a, um, there is a optimal um, frequency in sending out direct mail whereby sending more, sending them more frequently will not yield you any better response than sending them out less frequently. So in other words, if I sent out postcards every week and every time I sent them out, I generated five leads per week. But when I sent them out once every two weeks, I generated 10 leads. Does everyone understand that that's the same? In a two-week period, whether I send them out every week or every two weeks, I generate 10 leads. But the difference is it's way cheaper to send them out once every two weeks than to send them out every week. It's cheaper, but it's the same result. So if every week, if I sent them out every week, I got five leads every time, or I sent them out every two weeks and I got 10 leads, then sending them out two weeks would make way more sense. Now, what if I then said, well, wait a minute, I wonder if I sent them out once a month, if I get 20 leads. If we sent out the exact same mailer once a month and it did yield 20 leads, then sending it out once a month would be optimal, would be way better. It's cheaper to send it out once a month and it would yield exactly the same number of leads as sending it out every week or every two weeks. So, but what if that didn't happen? What if we sent it out once a month and when we sent it out once a month, we still only yielded 10 leads? What would we know? Right. Or, or sorry, um, we didn't yield t t 20. We, we only yielded 10. That means sending it out every two weeks, we could generate 20 leads a month. Sending it out once a month, we only generated 10 leads a month. So obviously sending it out every other week would be better. The bottom line is this. We are going to track our response. We're going to track it. And in tracking it, we're going to know the optimal frequency of how often to send our message, how often we need to run our ad, how often we need to direct mail. Um, and the response will tell us that when you do it too frequently, it's all you're doing is adding expense. You're not yielding any more results. Once we hit that number, then we know this is the optimal number of times to send this message. So kind of a long-winded answer, but I hope I made enough sense of that to you. I think um, once you understand the concept, it, it does make logical sense. All right, Andrea, who's next? Our next question comes from Bertrand, and she was at the Toronto Super Conference and saw a USP that one of our coaches used. It was, buy this house and I will sell yours for free. She says she really wants to use it and wants to know how it works. Um, okay, so... Um, Buy this home, okay, so number one, the condition is you have to be buying one of your listings, which means you are going to double end your listing, all right? So you're gonna double end your listing. Um, now, so that's the, that's the benefit to you is that if you move up, you're moving up and you're purchasing my property, then you're gonna double end that commission. But what you're also saying then is that you're going to sell their home for free. Now, remember, they're buying a home of greater value. It says move up to my listing, and I will sell your home for free. Now, here's the, the, um, the, the, the condition is your commission is free, not your broker's, not the cooperating broker. In other words, they're still going to pay a commission, just not to you, you yourself. You're going to give back the commission. And the commission is going to be smaller than the two other sides because they're moving up to your listing. They're buying a bigger, more expensive home on the other side and you're getting both sides of their commission. Okay, so in total, there are four commission sides in this transaction. You're getting the two biggest sides 
which is the move up property. You're getting both commissions on the move up property. The cooperating broker is getting one commission on the lower property and you're giving back your commission on that property. But I would suggest this. Um, you could you could certainly try that, but a better a better way of doing it would be <clears throat> to say um, move up to one of my listings and I guarantee to sell your home um, or I'll sell it for free. In other words, you want you want the you, you don't, don't want to just offer to sell it for free. What you want to say is this: if I don't sell it at a price acceptable to you, then um, then I'll do it for free. You know, then my commission is free. If I don't sell it for at least X amount of dollars, then my commission is free. Uh, in other words, we don't have to use free as an incentive to do business with us. You know, um, we can use a a result as a reason to do business with us. In other words, you would rather me get you full asking price for your property than to pay me nothing and not get you full asking price for your property. Does that make sense? You would rather I get you full asking price for your property and pay me a commission than for me not to get you full asking price and you to not pay me a commission. You'd much prefer to get more money for your property. So that's how your guarantee should work. It should revolve around a performance, not an inducement to do business because you're getting something for free. Um, but anyway, that's how that one, that one works. Um, what's next, Andrea? Our next guest um, or member would like to know where in the library they can find information to evaluate the results of the DISC personality test. Do you know where that is, Andrea? Well, I do know where you go to take the test or send the test. Unfortunately, what I do not know is where you find those results. Now, I've typed it in the file library and nothing came up right away. Well, you know, okay, well, first of all, you know that when you came to the super conference in your super conference manual, um, the, all of the test information is there. Everything is there, right? So if, when you go to identifying your personality, the tab in your workbook, um, it, it's all there. All of the personality types, the, uh, the DISC explanation, the, how to manage uh, traits, all of that stuff. It's all in your manual hard copy. It's very likely somewhere here as well. Um, but, uh, but I know for certain it's in, your, it's in your workbook from the super conference, so you can find it there. Our next guest, Larry, if you are not going to advertise on Craigslist or the local paper, does a hotline number have any value for direct mail or online marketing? Um, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest putting a, a hotline number in online advertising. That wouldn't make much sense, but it's, it's, it's for anything that's offline. Like anything that's offline, it would be appropriate to use a hotline. Um, anything that's online maybe isn't appropriate because the prospect is already online. They can simply click on the ad, click on the link. Um, so it wouldn't make as much sense. But, but if we're talking about direct mail, if we're talking about uh, uh, newspaper, if we're talking about magazine, um, then having a hotline makes total sense. You're giving the prospect options as to how to get the information. And I would argue that a lot of times the hotline actually works better than a website because the idea of a hotline is that when you call into the hotline, you're fully expecting to leave a message. Whereas when you go on a website, you're not expecting to leave a message. You're expecting to look at information. So um, that's really the difference is that we may generate fewer uh, calls into the hotline, but a huge percentage of the calls into the hotline result in a message, which is a lead. So that's that's really the way that you want to divide this up. Is that if we're talking about print, anything that's printed, we're we're going to also use the option of a hotline, and that includes signage, right, which we talked about today. Um, and anything that's online, we would use exclusively a, a website. Good question. Okay, our next question from Carol. Where are the templates for business cards and postcards? And currently we do not have a template to use like in our ad generator for something like that. But as we discussed on an ad clinic with Craig, for the business cards, you can use the USP generator for a guide or a reference on how they should look. You know, something that I do want to bring up about the business cards, because Craig brought this up and I just thought it was so smart and makes so much sense and I totally forgot. Um, just how sensible that is, is that 
you know, it's really important on your business card that we have, um, you know, a USB, something that sets us apart. It's very likely that we're giving this business card to somebody that we've met. You know, uh, maybe they came to a, a property, um, you know, we met the prospect in some way. Like our business card in and itself isn't a lead generator as much as it is a contact point. But if we're giving our business card to people that we've met, then having our picture on the business card makes sense so that they remember, oh yes, I met you, right? Um, but we also want to make sure that we include a unique selling proposition so that we set ourselves apart from all of the other seemingly identical business cards from the seemingly identical other realtors that they very likely may have met as well. But the thing that, um, that I want to bring up here is what about the other side? And Craig brought up a really, really good point. He said, you know, um, the reason that our team's business cards always had nothing on the other side is because I like to write notes on the other side. And he, very, very often, You'll grab your business card and you'll take a pen and you'll jot down a little note on the other side of the of your business card to and give it to the prospect. It's we can personalize our relationship with whoever we're giving this business card to, and it's the perfect place to write down that pertinent information and enough that now they have to keep it because whatever we wrote on the other side is written on our business card which has all of our contact details, including our unique selling proposition. So if on the other side of the postcard, it was printed on it and it was, there was no white space available to write a note and you just eliminated the opportunity to use that as a, um, as a, 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 an opportunity to personalize this message to whoever it is that you're giving your postcard to. And when I, when I thought back to that, it's like, yeah, I do that all the time. Do that all the time, write notes on the back of a card and, and, and give it to the prospect and vice versa. I, you know, I will take somebody's card and write a note on the other side. So that's some food for thought when you're creating your business card. <clears throat> Hope that helps, Andrea. Yes, Phil's question, he says, you've said that we should always fulfill our promise to our leads, like send them the list of properties. Can we call them, and if we determine they are not worthy, never send them the list? I don't understand why. I mean, send the prospect what they requested. You didn't say in the ad, a free list of homes to those who are worthy, right? Um, no, we offered to send, we offered a free list of properties, for example. You should send a free list of properties. That doesn't mean you have to send them a daily list of properties. It doesn't mean you ever have to call them again. But if if a prospect requests information, we're obligated to send the information that the prospect requested. That's all. And I I I I think I think that maybe we're confusing that with you know constant follow up or um, or more information. No, we're going to send a one time list of whatever it is they requested, or you know a free special report one time. But under no circumstances are we obligated to send them any additional information at any time. Okay, to shake things up a bit, I thought we'd go to an audio question. We have Sherry Minx, your line is now open. Hello. Hi Sherry, how are you today? Very well, thank you. Here's my question. Um, hold on one second. It took me by surprise, I had to put something down. Okay. No I have um, <clears throat> Success website has set up a Google Pay per click campaign for me, yes. and it's it's distressed sales in certain areas of East San Diego County. Okay. And, and I got 115 clicks. I got seven leads and one appointment. But what I found, and that was during a two-week period, and what I found was that all of none of the leads have any money to spend they are expecting to get a house for eighty thousand or a hundred thousand and what, what what my question is is that enough time for me to abandon that campaign or should i take the suggestion of success website and just tweak it some yes that's exactly what i was going to say and they're good at this okay so there's a couple ways i want to address this first of all um of the seven leads how many of them did you speak to um i spoke to I believe five. I made an appointment with one, um, 
and with her, uh, she told me she wasn't working with a realtor, but when I met with her, she let me know that she just made three offers with three different realtors, and she did not want to see my buyer's presentation. But so I gave it to her. I gave her the cancellation agreement and a cash savings buyer guarantee, and she seemed to be impressed with it. But she just disappeared, and she's not responding to me now. Okay. Well, we're, you know, the, this is what I'm looking for. Is is this the exception or is this the rule? Because if it's happening all the time, then we need to change something. But if it's a one-off, you know, exception, well, we're not going to change our whole system for an exception. Um, so here's what sounds like the reality. We need to tweak a couple things here. Um, we need to tweak the ad so that it uh, so that it attracts a, a a more appropriate audience. That might mean defining specific areas um, more so than you're doing now. It may mean defining a price point. It may mean um, defining a type of property instead of just offering distress sale properties. But instead of that, we can offer, um, you know, uh, uh, three and four bedroom, uh, great neighborhoods. In other words, offer a type of property that would more likely attract a buyer who can buy, as okay. opposed to saying free list of homes available for free. Like, yeah, you're going to get a lot of crap from that. Right now, I know that's not what the ad says, but let's take two extremes. One ad says free list of homes for nothing. And the other one says, free list of executive upscale properties starting at a million five, right? Those mm -hmm. are, they both offer a list of properties. But you would agree that the one on the bottom end is going to get you probably more prospects. No question, you're going to get more prospects. But we know those prospects are specifically responding to something for nothing. Whereas if we generate any prospects from the top end ad, we know this, they're looking for a property that starts at a million two or whatever it is that we said. So we may generate fewer from that, but at least we know that there's a qualification. So now, now what we want to do is we want to meet somewhere in the middle, right? We want to meet somewhere in the middle where we want to offer properties with the element of a good deal, but the kinds of properties that we're offering have to be viable. They have to be the kinds of properties that are available in East County. So we need to figure out what kinds of properties are, are selling in East County. And we need to offer those kinds of properties that are selling in East County in our ads. Okay. And that way you're not going to get people that are looking for something that doesn't exist. Yeah, I think the distressed um, part of the campaign is attracting people who don't have any money and they think, well, maybe I can get something really cheap. But as you know, you live in San Diego County. There's no homes in San Diego County for 100000 Right. Right. So now that doesn't mean we have to go right up to the other end of the scale and offer executive homes starting at a million five. We don't have to do that, but we can meet somewhere in the middle. And that's mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're going to work with success website to tweak the messages so that there's a qualification in there. Okay. All right. That helps. Thank you. Yeah. But here's what we know. Um, we, uh, and, and sorry, and the, the second thing, the second part is this, we know mm -hmm. the prospects are seeing the ad because mm -hmm. you generated over a hundred clicks to the ad in a couple of weeks, well over a hundred clicks to the ad. Now, right. here's how we, what we, what we'll find is if we tweak, not just the ad, but also the landing page, mm -hmm. then more of the prospects that click on the ad will actually ask for the information. Okay. Yeah. But if right now if right now they're going to your web page and your web page simply says distress sales, then yeah, that's really not that compelling. We need to we need to really customize the page so that it it would attract somebody who's looking for a property in East County in their price point. And it needs to it needs to uh you know, anything we can do to tweak it so it's very specific to them would mm -hmm. make it really attractive. Like okay. A map, well, a map of the area, um, you know. Uh, anyway, this is something that Success Website they do it every day. So I know that they can work with you to tweak the message and the landing page to accomplish this. Okay. Yeah, I have three of them there. I targeted um, Santee, El Cajon, and um, La Mesa. La Mesa. Yeah. So they say it says distress a list of distress sales and there's three different ones. They have three different landing pages. But I just found that everyone who who responded, who put their information in had no money. <laughs> they don't have any money to spend. 
and they right. expect to get something very, very cheap that doesn't exist. So, okay, I just wanted to know if I should go ahead and tweak it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And uh, in the meantime, what you might also want to do is look around at um, – uh, uh, at other um, small, see if there are any small local newspapers that, that service those those particular areas, um, El Cajon, La Mesa, little local papers. Do a Google search and see if there are any small little local papers that you might be able to run a really cheap ad in. Yeah, I, I have that. I've got something into a local paper now. They just aren't. They're very slow at responding and getting it done. So okay. that's in the that's in the works. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, because I've seen many, many good opportunities um, local paper-wise in the area, so that's something to consider. Okay. Thank you, James. You're welcome. Our next question is from Patty, and she says she needs some clarification on the rule of thumb on how long you run advertising with no results. How does she do her best testing for the different days and such before she abandons the advertising? Um, well, it's direct response. So it, as soon as you run out of variables, you can abandon the ad. So what's a variable? A variable might be I have one ad, and I ran the ad on uh, the weekend, and it didn't work. Okay, that doesn't necessarily mean the ad didn't work. Maybe the weekend didn't work, so we can try during the week. Or we tried the ad, and we ran it in this publication, and it didn't work, but maybe the ad would work in another publication. So there are those are called variables. So be the way that we know that an ad was unsuccessful is when we've tried several different variables, run it in different places, run it at different times, what, and, it, and it is ineffective, then we know that the ad itself is ineffective, right? So we immediately stop or change the ad. We change the ad once we've determined that even in trying different publications and different variables, the ad didn't work. We can try different places in a publication. Like for example, we ran an editorial style ad and it ran at the back of the newspaper. But we wanted to change the variable because that didn't work. So we took the same editorial ad, but we ran it in the front of the newspaper. And the identical editorial ad that didn't generate any response in the back of the paper did generate a response in the front of the paper. Right? That's, there's an example. Now, if we had just said, well, I ran the ad and it didn't work, so I'm going to scrap it. Here's what we do know. If we run that editorial ad in the back of the newspaper again, and the first time it didn't generate any response, it's highly likely that the second and third and fifth time we run it, it also won't generate any response in the back of the newspaper. We've got to change something to change the result. So that might mean changing the ad, but it also might mean changing where we run the ad. But as soon as we determine that an ad, regardless of where it's run, is ineffective, we stop running it and we run something else. We change it. But first we need to satisfy ourselves that we've, we've tested different variables to know whether an ad is effective or not. But that doesn't take a lot of time. Okay, really good question. Let's take one more for today, Andrea, and then we'll, um, and we'll sign off. Okay, and just, um, uh, just so everyone knows, regarding what James was talking about and testing your ads, next week, session three, Craig will, Craig will do a live webinar on direct response marketing, and he will show you exactly how he did all this testing, how you can come up with a spreadsheet, so that'll be very helpful for you to come on to next week. Excellent, 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 yes. Uh, okay, okay, perfect. Well, thank you. I'm sorry, Andrea, we have no, a question. No, no, yes, go. no, I have some questions, but I, um, those are best addressed personally, so we can go ahead and end if you'd like to. Perfect. Um, well, I want to thank everybody, first of all, for, uh, for posting their questions, whether you email them to me, which is awesome, or you post them in the chat. Regardless, we will get to them. Uh, by, we'll, we'll get to pretty much all of them. And there are some, I guess, that uh, are better answered personally. Um, so we can do that. That's not a problem as well. No need to um, embarrass anybody or ourselves. Have an awesome week, everybody. Um, and for those in Canada, happy Thanksgiving. Have a wonderful, beautiful day. I hope the leaves are changing colors and it's really pretty outside. Um, and, uh, and that you enjoy family and friends and uh, a little bit of time off. So having said that, Andrea, thanks so much for your help. And that concludes our helpline session for today. Thank you, James. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Talk to you all very soon.